acts of wildfires in the wildland urban interface. The Act of June 4, 1897, 30 Stat 11, is amended by adding at the end of the second full paragraph at 30 Stat 35, 16 U.S.C. 551, the following new sentence to ensure that there are su sufficient funds to provide the most modern equipment available for wildfire uh, suppression. Mr. Speaker, I ask for unanimous consent to dispense with the reading. Without objection. Is there objection? The, I'll reserve the right to object, please. Does the gentleman object to dispensing of the reading? I object to the dispensing of the reading. Mr. There is objection. The clerk will read. To ensure that there are sufficient funds to provide the most modern equipment available for wildfire suppression and to ensure that there are adequate numbers of personnel to manage and suppress wildfires, there is authorized to be appropriated to the Secretary of Agriculture such sums as may be necessary for fire suppression equipment and personnel to conduct forest fire pre-suppression activities on national forest system lands and emergency fire suppression or adjacent to such lands or other lands regarding which the Secretary has entered into a fire protection agreement. Page 379, strike line 21 and all that follows through page 380, line 8. Page 384, strike lines 3 through 9. Page 391, strike lines 19 through 24 and insert the following. Section creating jobs of small businesses in rural America and protecting safe drinking water. A. Water, Waste Disposal, and Wastewater Facility Grants. Section... I ask, I ask by unanimous consent to dispense with the uh, reading of the... The gentleman from motion. Oklahoma asks unanimous consent to dispense with the reading. Is there objection? There's no objection. The clerk will suspend. The gentlewoman from California is recognized for five minutes. Mr. Speaker, this, this is the final amendment to H.R. Gentlelady will suspend. House will come to order. This is the final amendment to H.R. 1947. It will not kill the bill or send it back to committee. If adopted, the bill will immediately proceed to final passage as amended. My amendment is a straightforward improvement that I believe both sides can agree is absolutely necessary. First, the amendment would protect homes and businesses nationwide from devastating fires by funding wildfire suppression, personnel, and firefighting equipment. Second, the amendment will help create jobs and small businesses throughout rural America and find safe drinking water to these communities as well. Mr. Speaker, I proudly represent Ventura County in California. In May, we had a dangerous wildfire. And House will come to order. In May, we had a dangerous wildfire that burned over 24,000 acres. It threatened homes in Camarilla, surrounded Cal State University at Channel Islands, and burned parts of Naval Base Ventura County. As the spring's fire raged, we looked for help from the brave men and women serving as firefighters, not only from my district, but throughout California and the western states. Due to their tireless efforts, homes and businesses were saved, and not one life was lost. Following the spring's fire, I had the op opportunity and occasion to thank the firefighters in my county. They showed me the real-time computer equipment they used to successfully fight this fire. With this equipment, firefighters could predict the direction of the fire and the terrain they would face next in real time. They asked that Congress make this life-saving communication equipment available to firefighters across this great nation. This is precisely the type of equipment my amendment would help provide along with aerial tankers and other firefighting aircraft. So many Americans rely on the selfless help of firefighters across the nation, most, most recently and courageously fighting the recent fires in Colorado, 
that has caused so much damage and loss of precious lives. Our firefighters put their lives on the line and we owe it to them and to our communities to provide adequate resources for fire suppression, personnel, and state-of-the-art equipment. My amendment would also support three critical rural development programs, water, waste disposal, and wastewater facility grants, emergency and imminent water assistant grants, and rural business opportunity grants. These grants help to provide critical water supplies to rural areas experiencing drought or other disasters. They also promote sustainable economic development, create jobs, and build stronger communities. Not only would these programs help in Ventura County, which was recently declared a rural disaster area by USDA, they would help in districts across the nation suffering from similar and tragic hardships. I came to Congress not to engage in partisan bickering, but to work with my colleagues on both sides of the aisle to solve the many critical challenges facing our nation, partnering with the states and our local communities during natural disasters and with communities who lack critical resources in difficult economic times is both a moral and economic imperative of this body. It is with this in mind that I ask my colleagues to support this important amendment to help fight wildfires and to support our communities when they need it most. Mr. Speaker, I yield back the balance of my time. The gentlelady yields back. For what purpose does the gentleman from Oklahoma seek recognition? To speak in opposition to the motion to recommit, Mr. Speaker. House will come to order. The gentleman from Oklahoma is recognized for five minutes. Mr. Speaker, I will not uh, dwell on the points made by the good lady, but I would like to take this time to discuss for just a moment the process that we've gone through here and the nature of what we are trying to do in crafting another five-year comprehensive farm bill. We have gone through the most amazing open process in the House Agriculture Committee two years in a row and we achieved consensus. Now the bill this year might not be quite the same as the bill last year and we have gone through I think an open process here on the floor where 103 or 4 amendments were considered by this body in open debate, in open discussion, a recorded votes, uh, once again trying to achieve a consensus. I know that not everyone, everyone, has in this final bill exactly what they want. I know some of my very conservative friends think that it don't, doesn't go far enough in the name of reform. I know some of my liberal friends thinks it goes too far in the name of addressing the needs of people. But I would say this to all of you. Ultimately, this body has to do its work. Ultimately, we have to move a product that we can go to conference with. Ultimately, we have to work out a consensus with the United States Senate so that we will have a final document that we can all consider together that hopefully we'll support and the president will sign into law. Now I have tried in good faith working with my ranking member and each and every one of you in every facet of these issues to achieve that consensus. I have tried and I hope that you recognize and acknowledge that. But we're at this critical moment. Whether you believe the bill has too much reform or not enough, or you believe it cuts too much or it doesn't cut enough, we have to move this document forward to achieve a common goal, to meet the needs of our citizens, no matter what part of the country, no matter whether they produce the food or consume the food, we have to meet those common needs in a responsible fashion. 
I plead to you, I implore you, put aside whatever the latest email is or the latest flyer is or whatever comment or rumor you've heard from people near you or around you. Assess the situation. Look at the bill. Vote with me to move this forward. If you care about the consumers, the producers, the citizens of this country, move this bill forward. If it fails today, I can't guarantee that you'll see in this session of Congress another attempt. But I would assure each and every one of you, whether it's the appropriations process or amendments to other bills, the struggles will go on, but it won't be done in a balanced way. If you care about your folks, if you care about this institution, if you care about utilizing open order, vote with us. Vote with me on final. And if you don't, when you leave here, they'll just say it's a dysfunctional body, a broken institution full of dysfunctional people. That's not true. You know that's not true. Cast your vote in a responsible fashion. That's all I can ask. Thank you, my friends. I yield back, Mr. Speaker. Without objection, the previous question is ordered. The question is on the motion to recommit. Those in favor will say aye. aye. Those opposed will say no. no. The noes have it, and the motion fails. Mr. Speaker, I ask for a recorded vote, the please. lady from California. A recorded vote is requested. Those favoring a recorded vote will rise. A sufficient number having risen, a recorded vote is ordered. Members will record their votes by electronic device. Pursuant to Clause, 8 of, Clause 9 of Rule 20, this five-minute vote on the motion to recommit will be followed by five-minute votes on passage of the bill if ordered and approval of the journal if ordered. This is a five-minute vote. The House now voting on a procedural motion to change the Farm Bill. This motion would, among other items, support wildfire fighting, firefighting efforts. A vote on final passage possible after this. We could also see a vote on the House Journal. This, again, a five-minute vote. President Obama and the First Family are back at the White House today after the President's meeting with world leaders at the G8 summit and talks with German Chancellor Angela Merkel. Vice President Joe Biden is on the road today. He's in Las Vegas this afternoon speaking to the League of United Latin American Citizens Youth and Young Awards Adult Awards Banquet.
On this vote, the yeas are 188, the nays are 232. The motion is not adopted. The question is on passage of the bill. Those in favor will say aye. Those opposed will say no. The ayes have it. Call for a recorded vote. A, requested, a recorded vote is requested. Those favoring a recorded vote will rise. A sufficient number having risen, a recorded vote is ordered. Members will record their votes by electronic device. This will be a five-minute vote. And a final passage vote now of the House's five-year, half-trillion-dollar farm bill. There's been bipartisan opposition to plan cuts of the legislation's $20.5 billion provision for food stamps. About one in seven Americans use the food stamp subsidies to feed their families. But the cost of the program has doubled over the last five years to nearly $80 billion. The bill itself would cut about $4 billion a year in overall spending on farm and nutrition programs. It expands crop insurance, and it creates a new kind of crop insurance that takes effect before the farmers' paid policies do. House Speaker John Boehner once again has said that he will vote for the bill. The Senate passed its version of the Farm Bill last week with about $2.4 billion a year in overall cuts and a $400 million annual decrease in food stamps.
All members voting. On this vote, the yeas are 195. Ms. Brownlee. The yeas are 195, the nays are 234, the bill is not passed. <laughs> Objection, the motion to reconsider is laid upon the table. Pursuant to Clause 8 of Rule 20, the unfinished business is the question on agreeing to the Speaker's approval of the journal, which the Chair will put de novo. The question is on agreeing to the Speaker's approval of the journal. Those in favor will say aye. Those opposed, no. In the opinion of the Chair, the ayes have it, and the journal stands approved. The House will be in order. The House will be in order. For what purpose does the gentlewoman from New York arise? To address the House for just one moment, Mr. Speaker. The gentlewoman is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Yesterday I was unavoidably detained at a meeting and missed the first votes of the day. Had I been present, I would have voted no on roll call number 254 the motion on ordering the previous question on the rule, and no on roll call number 253, HRES 271, the rule providing for further consideration of HR 1947, Federal uh, Agriculture Reform and Risk Management Act. Speaker, the House is not in order. The gentleman is correct. The House will be in order. Without objection, the gentlewoman's statement will appear in the record. Thank you, Mr. Speaker.
The chair will receive a message. Speaker, a message from the Senate. Mr. Speaker. Madam Secretary. I have been directed by the Senate to inform the House that the Senate has passed H.R. 475 to amend the Internal Revenue Code of 1986 to include vaccine, vaccines against seasonal influenza within the definition of tax, taxable vaccines. Thank you. The chair lays before the House the following personal requests. Leave of absence requested for Mr. Hastings of Florida for June 19th. Mr. Mr. Honda of California for June 19th and Thursday, July, June 20th. And Mr. Gary G. Miller of California for June 19th and for the balance of the week. Without objection, the requests are granted. The chair announces the speaker's reappointment pursuant to 44 U.S.C. 2702 and the order of the House of January 3, 2013 of the following individual on the part of the House to the Advisory Committee on the Records of Congress, effective June 24, 2013. Mr. Jeffrey W. Thomas of Columbus, Ohio.
For what purpose is the gentleman from Miller and Mr. Speaker, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I ask unanimous consent to speak out of order for one minute for the purposes of inquiring of the majority leader the, the schedule for the week to come. Without objection. I yield to my friend, the uh, majority leader. Thank the gentleman from Maryland, Democratic Whip, for yielding. Mr. Speaker, on Monday, the House will meet in pro forma session at 11 a.m. No votes are expected. On Tuesday, the House will meet at, no at noon for morning hour and 2 p.m. for legislative business. Votes will be postponed until 6.30 p.m. On Wednesday and Thursday, the House will meet at 10 a.m. for morning hour and noon for legislative business. On Friday, the House will meet at 9 a.m. for legislative business. Last votes of the week are expected no later than 3 p.m. Mr. Speaker, the House will consider a few bills under suspension of the rules, a complete list of which will be announced by the close of business tomorrow. In addition, I expect the House to take up and pass two bills from the Resources Committee, H.R. 2231, the Offshore Energy and Jobs Act, authored by Chairman Doc Hastings, and H.R. 1613, the Outer Continental Shelf Transboundary Hydrocarbon Agreements Authorization Act, sponsored by Representative Jeff Duncan of South Carolina. These two bills continue our efforts to increase domestic energy production, to foster an environment of economic growth, and lower energy costs for working families. Finally, Mr. Speaker, I anticipate bringing to the floor H.R. 2410, the Agricultural Appropriations Bill, authored by Representative Robert Adderholt of Alabama, and I yield back. I thank the gentleman for his uh, comments, uh, and I would ask him a couple of questions about uh, bills that are not, not on the uh, announcement. Uh, the gentleman and I had a colloquy uh, last week about student loans. Uh, on uh, uh, that there are not, uh, no action on those is uh, on the uh, calendar uh, for next week, uh, if, I, if I'm correct. Uh, can the gentleman tell me, knowing, as we know, that uh, student loan rates will double uh, in July from 3.4 percent to 6.8 percent, uh, and, can, and uh, in light of our discussion last week, can the gentleman tell me whether there is any uh, uh, thought that there will be some action taken by us uh, prior to the July 4th break, and I yield to my friend. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, the um, gentleman knows that the House has acted, uh, that uh, the position of the House is, is one uh, very close to where the President's public position on student loans has been. We don't want to see student loan rates double. Uh, we also want a long-term solution uh, to, the, to the problem on the fiscal end uh, while helping students. And, you know, if the gentleman witnesses what just happened on the floor, it just seems that on bills where there are solutions and bipartisan, <clears throat> bipartisan indications of support, uh, there seems to be a decision uh, by the part of he, his leadership, perhaps himself, to say, hey, we're not going to go along with bipartisan work and success, and maybe we're just going to make this a partisan issue. I'm fearful that the same is at work on the student loan issue, Mr. Speaker. I hope that that is not the case, because I know the gentleman shares with me a desire not to allow students to be put in a position to face a doubling of interest rates if they decide to incur additional student loans. So I would say to the gentleman his question, uh, we are stand ready to work in a bipartisan fashion, have indicated so to the White House. Uh, the Senate doesn't seem to be able to produce anything. The House is the only one that produced something very close to what the President's position is to make student rates variable, uh, to allow for those rates to be capped so the exposure uh, is not what it would be. Uh, otherwise, unfortunately, no movement yet. We stand ready to work, though, and I yield back. I thank the gentleman uh, for his comments. And very frankly, I wasn't going to mention what happened on the floor today. But the gentleman has brought it up. And the gentleman is correct. The committee passed out a bipartisan bill. A lot of Democrats voted for that bill. The problem, of course, is that 62 Republicans voted against the bill as it was amended, notwithstanding the fact they voted for the last amendment that was adopted, which we think was a draconian uh, amendment that would have hurt uh, the poorest citizens in our country very badly. So we turned a bipartisan bill into a partisan bill. And I'll tell my friend, very frankly, you did the same thing, not you personally, but uh, your side of the aisle, did the same thing with respect to the Homeland Security Bill. 
which was reported out on a voice vote from the Appropriations Committee uh, that we would have voted for on a bipartisan basis, except an amendment was adopted with your side voting overwhelmingly for it, knowing full well that our side could not support that. So I tell you with all due respect, Mr. Majority Leader, uh, I wasn't going to bring up what happened today. But what happened today is you turned a bipartisan bill, necessary for our farmers, necessary for our consumers, necessary for the, the people of America, that many of us would have supported, and you turned it into a partisan bill. And very frankly, uh, 58 of the 62 Republicans voted against your bill voted for the last amendment, uh, which made the bill even more egregious. We disagreed with the $20 billion cut, uh, and you uh, up the not you personally, but uh, your side up the ante. So I will tell you, my friend, uh, we're prepared to work in a bipartisan fashion. Uh, and very frankly, uh, with respect to the student loan bill, it was very close to the president's uh, bill. Uh, and we would have supported it, uh, it had it been uh, even close to the president's bill. What your bill does, as you know, uh, puts those taking out a student loan uh, at risk of having their interest rates substantially increased in the future. Uh, the president suggested, yes, let's get a variable rate that sh re reflects market rates, but then when you take out the loan, just like you do with your house loan, you know what your interest rate is going to be. So we have a difference on that. I think it's a good faith uh, in, uh, disagreement uh, on that. But I will, uh, will say to you that, yes, I have been concerned about the inability to take a bill reported out of committee that is bipartisan in any nature and turn it into a partisan bill. That's what happened on this floor today. It was unfortunate, as I say, for farmers. It was unfortunate for consumers. And it was unfortunate for our country. Uh, if the gentleman wants to pursue that, I'll yield to him. I appreciate it, gentlemen, Mr. Speaker, and allow me to just respond. Uh, the Sutherland Amendment, to which the gentleman speaks, uh, is an amendment that had been discussed for some time with the ranking member, with the chairman. The gentleman himself, I'm sure, Mr. Speaker, was aware of Mr. Sutherland's amendment. Mr. Sutherland's amendment reflects what many of us believe um, is a successful formula uh, to apply to a program that has, in the eyes of the uh, GAO, in, in the eyes of the independent um, auditors who look at these programs, a program that is in dire need of improvement because of the error rates and the waste and the other things that are occurring in this program. In addition to that, it reflects our strong belief that work, that able-bodied people should have the opportunity and should go in and be a productive citizen. That's what this amendment says. It gives states an option. It was a pilot project because it reflects a winning formula to the welfare reform program back in 1996 that was put into place. With unequivocal success, able-bodied people going back to work, working families beginning to have productive income, not just taking a check from the government. There was never an intention at all for our side to say we want to take away the safety net of the food stamp program. Absolutely not. This was a pilot project. That was it. It was up to the states whether they wanted to participate to see if they could get more people back to work. Again, consistent with what the GAO reports have said over and over again, these programs are in need of reform. And again, it was not as if this amendment came out of thin air. The gentleman, the ranking member, the entire leadership on the minority side knew this amendment was there. And the gentleman forever is on this floor, Mr. Speaker, talking about regular order, talking about the need for us to have open process, perhaps to let the will of the House work, uh, uh, be, be worked, and then go to conference. That was what the goal here was, let the will of the House um, allow to be uh, seen through, work its will, and then go to conference, and then we would try and participate in a robust discussion with the other side of the Capitol to see if we could see clear on some reform measures to a bill and a program that is in desperate need of that. And Mr. Speaker, again, what we saw today was a Democratic leadership in the House 
that was insistent to undo years and years of bipartisan work on an issue like a farm bill and decide to make it a partisan issue. And, and Mr. Speaker, it is unfortunate that that is the case. I do agree with the gentleman. But I hope that we can see our way to working on other issues where there is potential agreement. Yes, we have fundamental disagreements on many things. But we're all human beings representing the 740-some thousand people that put us here and expect us to begin to learn to set aside those agreements, find ways we can work together. Today was an example. The other side, Mr. Speaker, did not think that was their goal, did not think that was an appropriate mission, and instead decided to uh, em emphasize where they perhaps differed when we wanted to reform it in a certain area. And I yield back. I thank the gentleman for uh, yielding back. We clearly have a profound disagreement. Uh, when we were in the majority, we got no help on your side, Mr. Majority Leader. You remember that. Zero, one, two, three, four, on programs that we felt very strongly about. There was no opportunity to have bipartisan dialogue. There was no opportunity to have bipartisan uh, agreement. Uh, one final passage. The gentleman uh, refers to regular order. Very frankly, the person who talks about regular order most is your speaker. And you talk about regular order. We ought to pass a bill, and then we ought to go and have an agreement. Some 90 days ago, I believe, we passed a budget. At your insistence, the Senate passed a budget. Good for them. We have not gone to conference. You have not provided an opportunity to go to conference. You haven't appointed conferees. That's regular order. Gentleman wants it on one bill, but apparently not all bills. I tell my friend, we want regular order. We want to go to conference. We want to undo the breaking of an agreement that we made in the Budget Control Act, which said there'd be a firewall between domestic and defense. You have eliminated that firewall. You've assumed sequester is in place. Sequester is bad for this country. You and I tend to agree on that, I think. But the fact is, there's no legislation to undo that sequester except the legislation you talk about passing in the last Congress, which is dead, gone, and buried. Yes, we want regular order. The reason the bill lost today is because 62 of your members rejected Mr. Lucas's plea, which I thought was a very eloquent plea, in which he said, I know some of you don't think there's enough reform in this bill, and I and know some of you want, think there's too much reform. But Mr. Peterson and I brought out a bill that was a bipartisan bill, supported by the majority of Democrats and the majority of, the, I think all Republicans, maybe, on the committee. I'm not sure of that, Mr. Leader. But the fact of the matter is, it was a bipartisan bill, just as Homeland Security was a bipartisan bill, and it was turned into a partisan bill. And you respond that the Southern Hill Amendment was for reforms. That's exactly what Mr. Lucas was talking about. He was saying some people don't think we went far enough, and some people think we went too far. Mr. Sutherland thought we hadn't gone far enough. And 58 Republicans voted for Sutherland that then turned around and voted against the bill, the very reforms you're talking about. So don't blame Democrats for the loss today. You didn't bring up the farm bill when it was reported out in a bipartisan basis last year. You didn't even bring it to the floor because your party couldn't come together supporting their chairman's bill. So that's where we find ourselves, Mr. Chairman. I wasn't going to bring up that bill at all. What happened, happened. And very frankly, when we lost on the floor, it was because we lost on the floor and we were in the majority. We produced 218 votes for almost everything we put on this floor. Don't blame Democrats for the failure to bring 218 Republicans to your bipartisan, Lucas-supported, uh, and Peterson-supported piece of legislation on the floor. We believe that, that that loss, that partisanship in this bill, hurt farmers, hurt consumers, hurt our country. Let's bring that bill back to the floor and have a vote on it that was reported out on a bipartisan basis. I think it would pass. Maybe not because of your votes, that's your, been your problem all along. Don't blame Democrats for the loss of that bill. Don't blame Democrats for being partisan. You knew those amendments. Yes, we knew about them. 
Mr. Leader, just as you knew about them. And you knew we were very much opposed to some of those amendments. Notwithstanding the fact, all the leadership, I believe, I haven't looked at the record, voted for those amendments, just as they voted for the King Amendment on Homeland Security. Yeah, you pushed my button. I'm prepared to work in a bipartisan fashion. But I'm not prepared to work in a bipartisan fashion when it said, this is what we agree on, meaning your side, so you better take it if we're going to have any agreement. That's not the way it works. It never worked that way in America. That's not what America's about. America's about expecting us to work together. This bill was reported out overwhelmingly on a bipartisan basis, could have been passed on a, a, a very large bipartisan vote, and was precluded by the actions taken through these amendments on the floor, the, most of which we did not support. And you knew we did not. You know, I'm when you, you the, your party knew that we did not support. Yeah. So I'm uh, surprised when you talk to me about regular order, and there's nothing, nothing to do on the budget conference uh, that you wanted the Senate to pass a budget. They did. You have just told me that you wanted regular order and that we should have passed the farm bill so we could work together. You're assuming, of course, that the Senate would have gone to conference. I hope they would have. And I think they would have because I've talked to the chair. She would have wanted to go to conference, assuming we could have gotten votes on the Republican side of the aisle. But we also want to go to conference in regular order on the budget to solve the stark differences between the two parties. That's the only way you're going to get from where we are to where we need to be, by having a conference and trying to come together with agreement. My own premise is, Mr. Leader, that you don't have a conference because there's nothing to which Patty Murray could agree, that Mr. Ryan could agree, that he could bring back to your caucus and get a majority of votes for. Because they are for what you passed and nothing more than that. We're $91 billion apart. And if we divide it in two, just said, okay, we'll split the difference. You couldn't pass it on your side of the aisle, and I think you know that. I yield to, uh, Sir, I don't know that I have any more questions. I don't know that would be particularly uh, useful. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I thank the gentleman for yielding. But I yield to my friend. I, I, I thank the gentleman for yielding. I would just say, as far as the budget conference uh, is, um, is concerned, you know, the budget is something that traditionally, as he notes, has been a partisan affair. It is a document that each House produces uh, reflecting the philosophy of the majority of those bodies. And the budget contains um, a lot of different issues, two of which I think the parties have disagreed on vehemently over the last several years, taxes and health care. And we understand uh, you Mr. Speaker, the, that uh, the other side rejects um, our prescription on how to fix the deficit in terms of the unfunded liabilities on the health care programs. But we've said we want to work towards a balance. We think balanced budget is a good thing. Unfortunately, Mr. Speaker, the partisan position on the other side of the Capitol is no balance. No balance and raise taxes. So when you know that is the situation, there is no construct in which to even begin a discussion. Again, the budget has traditionally been that, a partisan document, whether who's in charge of which house, and then to be a guide by which you go about uh, spending bills after that. The farm bill, frankly, is a little different. It's for uh, working farmers. It's for, frankly, individuals who uh, need the benefit of the food stamp program. We believe we believe that you need to reform the SNAP program and reduce some of the costs because even the GAO, the independent auditors that we bring in, year in and year out say that though that program is rife with error rates, waste and others that we should be ashamed of. So we put forward our idea through the Sutherland Amendment to try and reform, put in place those reforms. But it's still in the construct of the Farm Bill. Again, to the gentleman's point, we do want to work together, but it's going to have to be about setting aside differences. And instead of saying, as the minority leadership did today, you disagree with us on that program, we're out of here. And the entire Farm Bill then 
does not have a chance to go to conference, be reconciled, hopefully reforms adopted so we can make some progress according to what the, even the independent analysts say should be done. So it, it's, it's, it really is a disappointing uh, day. I think that the minority has been a disappointing player today, Mr. Speaker, on the part of the people. Uh, but um, we remain ready to work with the gentleman. I'm hopeful that uh, uh, tomorrow, perhaps next week, will be a better week. And I yield back. I thank the gentleman for yielding back. Uh